Welcome to the Chronicle, thank and thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. To start with, um, in December 2016, Gambians went to the polls and changed a regime lightly perceived and seen as one of Africa's most notorious dictatorships. That in itself was democratic gains. What is your assessment of the Barrow government so far in maintaining these genes, these democratic genes? Um, you know, when we talk about democracy, um, it's about the space for uh, citizens to exercise their rights and the obligation of the state, you know, to protect those rights. Um, but certainly, knowing from where we came, like you said, removing that dictatorship, the tendency, as you would happen in any society, is that there will be an immediate period of open space that we are now enjoying, and citizens would exercise their right to freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, and all the fundamental freedoms that are, in any case, inside our constitution. Now, to assess the uh, performance of the government in terms of maintaining that democracy, we look at the obligation from two points of view, uh, from a negative obligation and from a positive po obligation. A negative obligation, that is, the state allows rights to be enjoyed, uh, so that you don't clamp down on citizens, you don't subject them to arbitrary, unnecessary arrest and all of that. Mm -hmm. And to a large extent, the state has kept its hands off, you know, freedom of expression, freedom of the media, um, you know, uh, freedom of assembly, of association, and, um, you know, popular participation generally has been enjoyed. Okay, even though there are instances where uh, citizens have been denied rights or have been arbitrarily, I mean, arrested or detained, um, the current case of uh, Killer Ace and a number of people are considered as, ab as arbitrary. And earlier, the case Dr. Sisse faced and um, some other people said to be invited by the police are uh, found that to be utterly unnecessary just for merely expressing their opinions. So, um, you know, on that score still, on the negative obligation in terms of keeping its hands off, I would say to a large extent the government has allowed democracy to prevail. Yeah. And the uh, democratic space has been widening. Has been widening, yes. Um, you know. Now, when you come to the positive obligation, is where now government takes deliberate steps to further protect, to further expand uh, human rights by either creating laws or repealing laws or you know, making institutions go the extra mile uh, to ensure that this right is actually guaranteed, protected. And that is where I see a huge failure on the part of the government, such that until now, we have a number of laws that continue to exist. Uh, we have a number of institutions that are still um, as they were, you know, uh, during the dictatorship. Um, and so long as those laws and institutions, and because of those institutions remaining that the, the way they were, uh, there will be practices or malpractices um, that we will see within government that endangers human rights. Uh, practices that would be about corruption, that would be about lack of transparency, that would be about lack of accountability. And so long as these things prevail, then democracy is limited. Mm. And how, how vulnerable is the country to corruption and malpractices as a result of um, what exists, uh, these, these, yeah. these issues and this system you said exists? Yeah, so, so I think the greatest failure of Barrow um, so far is his inability or failure or refusal to uphold accountability, ultimately, so that, um, you know, around the country, uh, the incidents of corruption uh, or practices that border a lot on corruption prevail. Like, um, say, even travels, there isn't any uh, effective, efficient method to control foreign travels within the government where we have seen, acknowledged by the government itself, of the huge amount of resources that are spent there. Yeah. We have seen uh, contracts created, um, like Semlex, for example, um, you know, 
foreign companies uh, coming, uh, getting into contracts. I mean, we have seen uh, projects such as the Banyo Rehabilitation, Rural Rehabilitation Project. You know, those kind of things are all taking place where there is no accountability uh, because there's no transparency in the first place. Yeah. We've seen instances of Baro himself receiving materials and money and then claim this is anonymous uh, donors. So that clearly what for me I am seeing is uh, Baro is not showing interest, commitment to transparency and accountability. And um, where you have bad governance, where you have dictatorship, where you have government failure, all right, classic is simply because accountability is at its lowest level. Mm. It is one subject that Barrow does not talk about. And accountability, not just in terms of management of those resources, but also in terms of delivery, performance. So that why do we have, say, Occupy Brikamba Area Council, or Occupy Westfield, or Dafadoy, those kinds of protests? It's simply because even public uh, uh, local governments, uh, because this culture of accountability has never been in this country um, since uh, probably independence. We've never given it the attention it deserves. And I've always said... And, and this is where the National Assembly in particular comes in. You talk about anonymous donors. We've seen when it first happened here, the recipients of the vehicles, fleet of vehicles from anonymous donors or an anonymous donor, the National Assembly members, I must stress that not all of them, but overwhelming majority of National Assembly members. Um, when it comes to fighting this, fighting this lack of transparency and accountability, as you've said, how would you rate the National Assembly members and their performance? I, I think their performance is, is woefully poor. Um, the National Assembly is the heart of our governance and development, because the National Assembly all other things said, is the key accountability institution in this country. If the government performs well, it's because the National Assembly is doing its job well. If the government fails, it is because the National Assembly is failing in its job. And here, when I say government, I mean central government and local government at the same time. If Gambians are enjoying quality goods and services by the private sector, it is because the National Assembly is doing its job effectively and efficiently. So where you have poverty and corruption and poor delivery of services, whether they are public services or services, I mean goods and services we are getting from the private sector of being poor quality and not value for money, it is simply because the National Assembly is not doing its job effectively. And so the National Assembly uh, over the period uh, could have taken a lot of actions, you know, to discipline this government. Like what? Um, for example, uh, the National Assembly, uh, the Constitution has multiple provisions that give power to the National Assembly to ensure oversight, to ensure public institutions deliver. Yeah. So that Section 75, for example, gives power to the National Assembly to censor a minister for misconduct, for violation of the Constitution, for poor delivery, poor performance. And when you look at the ministries in this country, and I'll say particularly Minister of Finance, uh, you can clearly see poor performance and even violation of the Constitution when you consider the Supplementary Appropriation Bill 2018. Mm. You know. And so uh, the National Assembly's failure to utilize the powers, the tools that are given to them by the Constitution as a means to ensure effective oversight, uh, for me, is definitely concerning and it indicates a, a failure. Mm. I mean, as I said, a lot of contracts are, are taking place, you know, in this country with the Chinese, with the EU, uh, with other private, local private companies, as I mentioned, the Banjul Road, I mean, project, or like Semles as well as I mentioned, not to mention all these instan in, in, instances of anonymous donors. Mm. I, I don't understand why the National Assembly, which is also a power that they have, could summon anybody in this country, from the president downwards, to summon you to a public hearing to get to know what happened, what is happening. And a lot of people said um, if the National Assembly members could accept vehicles as gifts from the president and the original source 
anonymous, what moral authority do they have to reprimand the president or anybody for that matter for any malpractice or any suspicion of corruption? That's a valid statement. So the, the National Assembly members, those who have received these vehicles, they have directly injured their own legitimacy and their own uh, moral authority and even their political authority because uh, they have a legal and political authority to hold the government accountable. So where they themselves act in cohort with the government to perpetuate uh, corruption, to perpetuate uh, such abuse of power, uh, clearly the, the, those members and the National Assembly as a whole, because ultimately they are all National Assembly members and they are inside the House, they have undermined the legitimacy and the authority, the legal and the political authority of the National Assembly to do its job as required by the Constitution. Okay. So I think that is a, a very concerning phenomenon. And it all adds to the uh, limited or even lack of accountability in the Gambia. And so long as accountability is lacking in any society, anywhere, that society is destined for failure. The accountability, I've made the point in many forums, the accountability is what tells you whether you are making progress or you are making failure. Mm -hmm. Accountability is what ensures that either rights are protected or rights are being violated. Accountability is what ensures whether you have electricity or you have no electricity. Whether there will be efficient health delivery services or education or good roads or there will be none. And so that if you look at the Gambia from independence to date, you can bring all of the explanation to one conclusion that the, the missing link in our governance and development process from independence to date is the lack of accountability. And, and Mari, you've been a strong advocate of participatory democracy. How participatory is today's democracy in the Gambia when it comes to government operations? Uh, basically, we would say uh, there is popular participation. Uh, simply because citizens generally are involved with their political parties, uh, in their localities, their communities, um, expressing themselves uh, on the media, on social media, um, holding their forums and, uh, you know, uh, protesting. Okay. So, in the basic sense, there is participatory democracy prevailing in the Gambia. Yeah. But the difference, though, is because this participation can be informed participation or it can be uh, an uninformed participation. So that ultimately what we are trying to look at is what is the value of that participation? Is it really enhancing uh, good governance? Uh, good governance in terms of ensuring protection of rights and freedoms, in terms of ensuring efficient delivery of public goods and services. Mm. So uh, democracy adding value to that. And that is where the failure is, or the limitation is. So yes, we have participatory democracy, but it's largely uninformed, such that that participation, that popular participation, is largely influenced by partisan uh, considerations, even ethnic con considerations. So that ultimately, uh, whether it is our political parties, where we belong, we don't even hold our political parties or our political party leaders to account much less to talk about the government itself you know, in a more effective way. So consequently, government is not delivering the way it should. Political parties or their leaders are not leading. And let me give you a practical example. In the parliament today, mm -hmm. all of the parties that are present there, they are all members of the coalition 2016. They had a manifesto. In that manifesto, they beautifully laid out the legal uh, constitutional uh, reforms that needed to be made in order to usher in the new Gambia. Mm -hmm. Until today, almost three years, we see that these coalition parties who have representatives in the parliament failing to effect any legal and constitutional change. So that there's only one that a private member, the majority minority leader from NRP, put forward a provision that Basically, it's about the tenure, mm. the security of tenure of members. But other than that, there are multiple provisions that they have listed in their manifesto mm -hmm. that would have fundamentally changed 
as I mentioned earlier, uh, that obligation, that uh, positive obligation, would have made the government see in practice expanding and protecting the democratic space. Yeah. But uh, all of these parties, all of them yeah. in the parliament, woefully failed to do that. And because they have failed to do that, with the president himself failing to also do that, essentially it means system change has failed in the gap. So we had regime change, but no, system change no, is still no, a no system change. And this lack of system change, uh, the culprit is President Adam Abaro and the seven political parties that put him forward as their candidate. Because those seven parties, uh, majority of them, UDP, DOI, PVP, NRP, are all represented fully in the National Assembly. So where Baro failed to uh, produce, create the necessary legal and uh, I mean constitutional uh, reforms, and uh, nothing stopped these four parties to go ahead with it. Among the options available to these National Assembly members, as you rightly said, is the tabling and sponsoring of private member bill. We've not seen that in this parliament. What explains this, Mari? Uh, poor leadership. I, I think poor leadership, and it exposes, uh, uh, for me, what is the quality of their commitment to democracy and good governance uh, and a better Gambia. Uh, clearly, for me, that is, uh, that is what it says. So uh, I, I will question any of these leaders of your commitment to democracy. It is one thing to make good statements, and all these leaders are very good at making very you know, high-sounding statements. Statements that are fact. Statements that are true. Either on the floor of the parliament, or in their political rallies, or in their statements mm. that they issue out. But those statements have not translated into action. And therefore, none of them can convince me that indeed I am committed to a democratic Gambia thriving on good governance principles. Okay. And ahead of the next election, we have seen either the announcement or the formation of new political parties. And the expectations are the field will be crowded when we go to the polls um, next time. Among all these political parties, at least the ones that are existing, that exist at the moment, as far as you are concerned, is there any fundamental difference between them that will give Gambians ample opportunity when it comes to choice as to who to vote for? Um, yeah, I, I may want to directly speak to that, uh, lest it's interpreted as uh, a support or belong to a particular party. Uh, but certainly there are ideological differences. Um, and I would put Doe on one side, and the rest of the other parties, uh, I'd put them in one fold ideologically. Uh, that is, as far as I understand, there are manifestos, there are statements, and there are programs that I follow. Yeah. And uh, in terms of policies as well for socioeconomic and um, you know, good governance uh, in the Gambia, um, I, I would say, uh, you know, the bad program is pretty tangible in, in my perception, yeah. uh, in my understanding. And, um, you know, not to say the others, I mean, do not have any good programs, but I, I find the program far more well articulated and, and, and pretty uh, pragmatic, practical, all right? Uh, but having said that also, uh, when I look at the overall leadership uh, management, governance of all of these political parties, there I don't see any difference. I see all of them as largely undemocratic, uh, at least not operating within democratic principles, practices. Uh, internal democracy is still limited. They hold their congresses, all of them, of course, I know. Um, and they, uh, each and every party claims their party is democratic. But uh, in my assessment, the quality of democracy in these parties uh, is hugely limited. And that is a big concern to me. Mm -hmm. Because, you see, one entity we don't talk about in our uh, 
conversations as Gambians uh, in understanding the issues concerns in our country is the political part. Mm. We take them to be, I don't know, as not important or uh, secondary or something like that. But uh, what Gambians get to know is political parties run the country because political parties produce the president. Political parties produce national assembly members, mayors, councillors. These are the people who run the institutions of governance and development in the country. Hence, effectively, it's political parties that are in charge. In any democracy, real democracy, you go to around in this world. So that if a political party, that's why we say a ruling party, mm. because you run the government. So if you are in opposition, you are a government in waiting. So that if any political party ruling on in opposition, you lack uh, you know, democratic and good governance practices uh, standards. The ability for you to now assume state power as a ruling government and deliver democracy is impossible. Because it is a practice that you are not practicing when you were not in government. L let me interrupt you here. How about what we have in our country today? It's a very rare case. The president resigned in order to contest for the presidency. So this argument came back and forth, and then always the response is, the president belonged to no party. Mm -hmm. He's an independent person. Does that in any way, as far as you are concerned, explains what we have in the country in terms of, according to you, um, lack of service delivery? No, that, that does not affect uh, the efficiency, the effectiveness of the government. Uh, the fact that the president is an independent candidate. He is an independent candidate, but um, it's unfortunate uh, by his own poor leadership and by the poor leadership of the parties, they have separated, as, as we have seen, uh, as this uh, uh, chaos among them. Mm -hmm. But those parties were supposed to be uh, his base, his foundation, the, the vehicle through which to deliver good governance and democracy. So, uh, but even where he has uh, separated with them, or most of them, uh, and the coalition in practice, uh, I would say, does not exist. Uh, still, as an independent president, I mean, all right, without a party, uh, cannot affect his ability to deliver democracy and ensure good governance. Mm -hmm. You know. So, uh, as I was saying earlier, for us, our failure is one we are yet to have parties that are effectively, you know, really democratic, um, so that they can translate that practice to when they assume government. Mm. But Mari, when we have political parties that elect their leaders that go to the Congress and that um, have institutions within the parties which says, which directs the parties as to who should do this, who should do that, what else do we need? What other democracy are we talking about? Yeah, it, it, it's more about quality than co quantity. Uh, it's more about values and standards than about uh, structures. All right, uh, you know, values, standards, and processes than just about structures, you know, and, and personalities, individuals. Yes, each party, they hold their Congress. They elect their, their leaders in that Congress. Um, they may have uh, an executive committee, a youth wing, a women's wing, and you can look at all of those structures and claim, yeah, I mean, within the party, there may not be any policy to stop anyone from contesting, all right, or to stop anyone from expressing his or her view uh, within the party, yes. But then when you look at it qualitatively, uh, how come, therefore, all of the parties we have, nobody ever challenged the existing party leader or the secretary general, you know? And we cannot, uh, you know, uh, but that will be optional if people do not challenge their leaders, um, yeah, not because yeah. the party stops yeah. you from challenging. Yeah. It's up to you if you don't yeah. know how yeah. does that, you know, yeah. that, so that, that is a, that's a, democracy. Yeah, that's a very superficial argument that on the surface looks nice. It is like saying uh, nobody stops women from contesting as president or as assembly in the Gambia, uh, you know, uh, even though to a large extent, women don't stand because there is an inherent obstacle, you know, embedded in our culture or in the way we understand religion, our society, uh, that prevents women from coming up. 
And so, uh, an, an, an informed mind, a mind that is not critical, would easily say, but yeah, nobody stops any woman to... to uh, indeed, you won't see any policy, any law written anywhere that a woman cannot stand for president. But there is an unwritten law actually in place. So that you go to all of these parties, they can show you their constitution, their policies, everything, and say, but I mean, uh, nobody stops anyone from contesting for party leaders. Are, are you implying that within parties, if members criticize um, the leadership, um, they have prices to pay? Well, they which may, not may, which, may, which yeah. may prevent them from doing so. Well, in, 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 in practice, it, it may have happened. I mean, one may need to sit to look at all these parties more critically. But then the point is, the, the, the culture within the parties, uh, which is the wider society, is such that you will not even criticize in the first place, much less get uh, punished for criticizing. You see, and this is where, uh, Sheriff, we have failed leadership even in our parties from independence to date. It is for those party leaders to realize, look, also we as Gambians come from a particular background. So, so culturally, mm. and you know, so, so culturally, we, when Sir Srif is the president, we, we all just want to, you know, venerate you and then follow you, and you know, and nobody wants to oppose you. Now, it is for the leaders now, like you in that leadership, to understanding the social so cultural milieu setting of us, your society, to take deliberate steps, knowing full well we have to build democracy. All right, we have to empower our citizens. This is why we have failed in, in our political parties in Africa. That we'll take deliberate steps. That I, as party leader, I will only serve two terms. I will make sure, first, in our laws, we introduce uh, time limits. We introduce gender quota, youth quota. We uh, ensure decision making. Uh, um, we have youth wing, women's wing, but we give them, in practice, in the law, specific powers, uh, privileges to say they, they, how they should influence, pop, I mean, decision making in the party. Mm. You know, so when you take those deliberate steps, that is how you nurture democracy within your party. Then just to sit back, you as the party leader, yeah, but I did not tell anybody not to challenge me. Mm. So and I, I hear all the party leaders say that mm. anyone can challenge me. Yeah. But in practice, nobody's going to challenge you. Mm. And, uh, let, let's move on, or let's take a very quick trip down memory lane to that meeting um, or those meetings that brought about the 2016 coalition. When the leaders met, they agreed. I'm not gonna argue on whether or not any document was signed, but what is clear is that they agreed that if the coalition candidate wins, he would serve a three-year term and then um, will resign or step down and the country will go back to the polls again. Even the president, I posed this question to the president in 2017 when he just arrived back from Dakar after Jamel left and he agreed, he told, he admitted it was three, three years that they agreed. Before we even go to the issue of whether or not the president should step down at the end of a three-year term, first, even that arrangement, a lot of people who didn't question anything at the beginning when that arrangement was made are now posing a lot of questions. Among the questions, what were the leaders, the coalition leaders thinking when they made this arrangement to say the president or who their candidate, if a candidate wins, he will serve three years and step down and go to the polls, knowing fully well that the constitution stipulates a five-year term for the president. And a lot of people are asking, what way are they thinking? And I will put the same question to you. As a civil society leader, what is your take on that? No, I, I think that was a beautiful idea. I, I agree with them on the three years. And folks got to go back and read that MOU that they refused to sign, you know, um, disgracefully. Uh, and also, more importantly, to read the manifesto, because they wrote a very good manifesto where they listed, you know, one by one, all of the things they would do in these three years. And the very rationale of the three years, I have listened to the person who convened that meeting, Ali Fasala, and he made a very beautiful analysis uh, of that. That the whole idea, you know, knowing where we come from, we take this period, you know, to remake our 
you know, nation state and, uh, you know, prevent self-perpetuation and all of that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I, I agree uh, with the idea of the three years. I think where the problem lies is their failure to be committed to that agenda that they created. You know, because if they had gone accordingly, we would have had uh, a new constitution so that, you know, by the end of the three years, we would have had a new constitution to usher in the third republic, and then we would have had new elections, and borough would not be part of it. And we could have done all of that. They could have set up the TRRC a long, long time ago, but they waited for so long to create its CRC, for example. You know, and they could have done a lot of amendments because uh, here now I hear this argument, but if, if the president steps down after three years, the vice president takes over. Yes, that is what is in the constitution. But in their manifesto, in their minds, when they met at Karabakh, the idea was to also change that provision 65 that allows uh, the vice president or the speaker to continue the rest of the time of the president to instead have an election within 90 days. Now, what would I have expected? Mr. Barrow would, given all of those things, charge his Minister of Justice mm -hmm. or the relevant authorities in government to look at that constitution. Some of these amendments is just a change of word or a, a line and insert a word or a line to create a huge change. So they could have, the time they were changing the age limit of the president, which is also one item they have mentioned in that constitution. I mean, in their manifesto. And the uh, tenure of the National Assembly members, which was another item mentioned in their manifesto. Now, if you have the ability to go and change those pro two provisions, what stopped you from doing, you know, 10 other provisions that could have all been done in one day? Mm -hmm. Because it was, there was going to be no difficulty because you, the parties, you control the parliament overwhelmingly. So if those things come, as in your manifesto that you had already discussed and agreed, all you got to do is to say, yes, I agree. And that didn't happen, and the coalition leaders failed in that regard, as you said. The Constitution says five years for a sitting yeah. president, yeah. and the president says he's going to go for five years. He's going yeah. to serve the full five years as stipulated <coughs> in the Constitution. Why should anybody say otherwise, make noise about whether or not the president should step down? Yeah, because the president or the presidency is ours. It doesn't belong to the person occupying it. You see, people got to understand things in their proper context. Adama doesn't own that presidency. It belongs to us. To acquire that position, he did not put himself there. He came with two orders, yeah, Jambi and Mama Kande, to appeal to the people. Hmm. All right? Yeah, Jambi never said three years or two years. Mama Kane never said four years or six months. It was Adam Barrow, on his own volition, said three years. And in a democracy, when candidates go to seek elected officials, when they go to seek the mandate of the people, mm -hmm. the people vote them based on the promise that they deliver. That is why we vote. So we look at all the candidates based on what they said they would do. On the basis of that, citizens vote for them. So the, we con the Constitution for, supersedes. This is not a matter. Yeah, this anything. is not a matter. Can you accept that? Yeah, yeah, I accept that. And this is nothing to do with the Constitution. But Barrow is basing his argument on the Constitution. Yeah, he is misleading himself, all right, and generating falsity. This has nothing whatsoever the to do with the Constitution. He said the same constitution, the constitution said five years. He's going to say yeah, five years. Yeah, but he years. should also say, remind him. And he knows that that same constitution says you can resign. But that will, can... Be, that will be optional. That will be voluntary. Yes, yes, yes. If he doesn't resign, that will be voluntary. But, but the man so said the constitution the, said five years. The, I'm going to serve five years time. Because, so what the constitution says, I hope his legal advice will tell him. The constitution is giving you a limit. It is not giving you uh, a, a maximum. It is not giving you a minimum. It is giving you a limit that at the maximum, the term of the president is five years. But between, before that five years, that president can be removed for multiple reasons, which are all inside the Constitution. Can he be removed based on his arrangement with his coalition? Oh, oh, definitely. You see, any elected official
can be removed without election. And it is democratic. Yes. Because citizens, when they are dissatisfied with their leader, for example, when that leader engages in any form of misconduct or anything, there are legal processes to remove him, like impeachment in the parliament. But also, the citizens of that country have the right to stand up, to express that such a leader steps down. Because that leader, um, either to make sure he abides by his own word, promise, or because he has lost the legitimacy to Even govern. Even if the leader bases his argument on constitution? No, but this is only a constitutional matter. That is the confusion. Look, right now, uh, not long ago, a few weeks ago, in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. they, they removed the governor because the governor made statements that they found to be you know, racist or chauvinist, something like that. And they elected him. His time is not ended yet. The constitution there is clear how the time of the president. But that same constitution has given power to the citizens to express themselves. And presidents, elected officials, you are not in office because of the constitution. You are also in office because of legitimacy. <laughs> Madi, let's get this straight. Um, so the constitution, as you said, gives the rights and powers for the citizens to express themselves. And we've seen this is why people who are in support of December, the three years journal, and their rights of protest are supporting it. But can we be clear on this, the issue of removing protesting, going to the streets and then demonstrating and then hold the president to account on, based on what he had promised, based on what he agreed with his coalition partners, is one thing. If people take to the streets, either in large numbers or in small numbers come December, to express their grievances and their dissatisfaction to the president based on the fact that he's done perhaps what was ahead on the citizens. And that does not force the president to voluntarily come and resign. What else is available to the citizens? That's all that's available to them. They can um, go back home. That also is available to them. You know, you can have others also uh, counter protest to say, no, I mean, the president will serve five years. Uh, citizens, that's also up, up to citizens. And they can protest for one day, for two days, for one month, or for one year. Um, it is their right to protest. That right uh, to protest, is, 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 there's no time limit to it. You just protest. Mm. You and but we're not asking people to protest to remove the president. That's uh, because you mentioned the issue of removal. Removing people have the right to, to yeah. remove. Yeah, I mean, um, if some folks feel uh, the president, as he promised, that he will stay for three years, at the end of three days he needs to step down, they have a right to that protest to make sure the president steps down. So is they will protest as long as they feel necessary to make the president step down. And is this, a, is this a protest, is this an initiative you, as a civil society leader in this country, will take part in, active part in? I, I'm, I'm not sure whether I will uh, uh, take part in the protest or how long I will take part, uh, be in that protest. But what I do know in principle and in practice uh, is that uh, Barrow should step down at, at the end of three years because he said it. The reason why I'm, I want to hold him accountable on that because I don't want political deception to become a culture, to continue to be a culture in this country. I don't want leadership that is not accountable to become, continue to be a culture in this country. I don't want political lies to become a practice in this country. Because where political deception, political indecency becomes a, a culture, a norm in any democracy, in any society, the tendency for um, abuse mm. to arise is very high. This is the same scenario with the Ajame. He, what he would say here and what he would do next, there are two different things. And when one person can say this, and then he is not going to fulfill it. The tendency for abuse to take place is very high. And Sheriff, let me say this finally on this point. Mm -hmm. The presidency is not a joke. The person who sits as president, that seat is not a joke. Our constitution says the sovereignty of the Gambia resides in the people of the Gambia. The legitimacy of the government is derived from the people. So anyone who is coming to want to be a president, or a National Assembly member, or a mayor or chairperson, you are seeking an office to be given that legitimacy and authority by the people. 
And when you come with a promise on the basis of which we give you legitimacy, that matter is not a joke. We have to make sure that you don't uh, uh, soil, you don't pollute our legitimacy, our authority as a people. And so for me, the president, anyone who is seeking political office in this country, the people should hold you to account based on what you said. And, and if you, you fail to do that, I think people should rise up against you to make sure you, re you are removed. That legitimacy is taken back from you. If you have the opportunity right now to sit face to face with President Barrow on this issue of three years or five years, what would you tell him? I will tell him, Mr. Barrow, respect your word. Be a man of honor. Uh, respect three years and step down. Go back to your manifesto and implement it. He has abandoned his manifesto completely. Go back to your manifesto and implement it for the remaining time. That way, you do not only do great service to yourself, but you do great service to the Gambia. We need leadership that serves our people. Mm -hmm. Our leaders need to know, as president, you are not there for yourself, you are there for the people. Serve our people. But you cannot come to us with a promise, when the base of that we give you our mandate, only for you to now overturn that mandate as you liked it. It's dishonest. So I would have told him, respect your word, be a man of honor, uphold sacred values, and step down. Mm. That will be my advice to him. Mm. And some people are raising the issue of the lack of communication or channel of communication from the presidency, the government, to the citizens as far as this three or five year issue is concerned. Some people are saying what the president could have done is, okay, come forward and tell the people, okay, I gave you my word and I know that, but for so and so reason, I'm not able to stick to what I promised and then I'll go for five years, you know, something like that. And that will perhaps, you know, diffuse the, the, the political um, tension as far as this issue and any potential danger associated with it. Would that have been, would that have been enough? Uh, not so enough, but it would have been very good. Uh, and again, what you just said exposes once more the poor leadership of not just Barrow, but of our political parties. Uh, they, you know, as adult Gambians, senior Gambians, as leaders of this country, constituted themselves into a coalition and made serious agreements. When they know that this agreement is not going to hold, after we have given them our mandate, honesty, leadership, decency requires that they come back to the people and tell us we cannot do this within three years because of A, B, C, and D. I'm sure Gambians are reasonable people. They will listen and then we make compromises. Mm -hmm. And that would have solved all of this problem. But to assemble yourselves, as Barrow and his people did in Brikama, talking about pouring hot water on people, talking about shooting down people, saying, you know, by force you are going to serve five years, is the height of irresponsibility, all right, and political indecency. But look, a few days ago, the Minister of Interior, all right, who is now former, said, they will dialogue with the three years Jotna people. Why didn't you say that in Brikam? Is Why didn't you say that last year? Is it late to do so now? Too late? Too, no, too late? No, no, it is not late. It is not late. I think uh, it, it can still be uh, done. Uh, and so uh, I would encourage him, Barrow particularly, to engage the Gambian citizenry on this matter for his own interest. Because if he allows we uh, get to December without him engaging with the citizens and making necessary compromises, I doubt he can survive it because, you see, hmm. uh, when there is a protest, any number of people who emerge, even five people, and they are uh, two things. You give them a permit. Now, here, when they give a permit, they will tell you, you know, it's from here to Westfield, you know, one hour, 30 minutes. Hmm. Now, those who are going to protest for that's three years, Jotna. They're not going to, they're not protesting for one hour. What's the worst thing that can happen in December? So the worst thing that could happen is the government, therefore, whether you give permit or not give permit, you may be forced to disperse people. And in that dispersing of the protesters, 
the tendency for government to use heavy hand is high. And when you use such heavy hand, you generate a lot more sympathy mm. from the rest of the population. Uh, the nature of response that the government itself gives, unfortunately, I mean, for example, God forbid you even use guns. The, you know, you are also going to generate uh, international support for citizens. Because the international community, the language they would say is the government should respect the rights of citizens to protest. You look at what is happening in Hong Kong. What is every government telling China? Even though China hasn't responded yet, respect them. And these people have been protesting for 11 weeks. So in the final analysis, it is not in Barrow's favor for there to be a protest in December. Right. His advisors should, should tell him, get up and prevent this before it happens through dialogue and compromise. Okay. You talk about permits, like, of course, a lot of other issues. You are very opinionated when it comes to public order act. For people to take to the streets in this country and protest, there are requirements. They must apply for a permit, and they must be given permit before they go out there and protest. This is, you know, what the public order act says. You always argue differently when it comes to this. Should people take to the streets? If and whenever the police say, no, you don't have a permit, we rejecting your application or denying your application to permit, to have a permit to protest. Yes, I am 100% opposed to the Public Order Act. I take it to be an unjust law and it should be disregarded. So people should protest even yeah. if the police say yeah. you don't have permit to yeah. protest? Because protest is a guaranteed right in our constitution. Uh, protest. Freedom of assembly is a peaceful, legitimate, legal means of uh, citizens participating, influencing decisions, holding their government to account. Now, anyone who breaks the law in the course of that protest, like you throw a stone or burn down anything or, I mean, loot, we expect law enforcement to be there. Yeah, but man, it's to... the same law. If the law, the Public Order Act, I mean, this particular law, says people must have permit in order for them yeah, I'm, to protest. Yeah, I'm saying, I'm saying that, I... Don't you think in, for you to ask people to disregard that and go and protest even in the absence of that permit, don't you think that's irresponsible of you? No, no, it's not irresponsible. Our unjust laws need to be resisted. I'd rather uh, violate an unjust law and then face the consequences than submit myself to it. That's a moral... Uh, Principle. And, and any citizen can decide what is just and what is no, unjust. No, 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 no. You can't decide what is just and, and unjust. And there are, uh, and the government, government knows that. There are uh, universally established human rights values and standards for democracy, for good governance. And certainly, those are clear, they are not in doubt. For example, to go and loot, there is no law that would say, you have a right to loot. And so anyone who loots, uh, you will face, face law. So your position is anybody, any Gambian can just go up, get up, and go and protest without consulting or asking for permit? Uh, not asking for permit. You can notify the police. And that is what uh, regional African law and international law prescribes. That freedom of assembly laws, public order laws, should uh, create a regime in which citizens who wish to protest would go and uh, s s notify the police. All right? But the current public act as it is, and all the protests that have taken place for which the police have denied citizens to protest, they have no justification whatsoever to deny those people to protest. So it means the Public Order Act is just a power tool in the hands of the government to abuse rights. There's no justification in Brikama, Occupy Brikama Area Council. Uh, why would you deny them a permit? Even when you deny them a permit, what violence did we see, uh, security threat did we see in Brikama? Nothing. The protesters were responsible people and they did what they were doing. And we can go back all the time, all the way to uh, Occupy uh, Westfield when they were denied a permit. I mean, on what basis? There's no basis whatsoever. So that law as it is, if we had a responsible government, maybe that law would not be an issue because they would know, even when the law gives power to the IG or the governor to grant or deny a permit, they would not use it irresponsibly. 
So if anybody has been using the Public Order Act irresponsibly, it is the government for denying using that law without any basis to deny a permit when there is no reason to deny a permit because they have never said uh, when people want to protest here in Brikama Area Council, for example, in Brikama, they never, the IG never produced any facts to say violence is going to happen. These people are going to create violence. And no violence happened. And all the protests that I know that they, they gave a permit or, or did not, no violence erupted. Now, spontaneous protests do emerge, like in Sarakonda. That also is a, is a fact, because not every protest will be planned or organized or led by any group or any individual. But things can emerge in society mm. that people spontaneously, you know, just rise up. But that is why we have law enforcement. When that happens, police should be able to know the people are rising up and appear to make sure that, you know, uh, that spontaneous protest, law and order is there. Those who break the law are taken before the law. It's Mar a very simple thing. Marie, that's where we end this. Thank you very much. Thank you.